Okay, here we go again. I'm glad that everybody is watching. I've been trying to update, uh, upload new interviews every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And it's not an easy thing to do. But when I jump into these conversations, I always forget to ask people to subscribe. I know it's the most obnoxious part of these YouTube videos when people ask you to like, comment, and subscribe. Um, I promise I'll never ask you to smash the, the like button. It won't be that ridiculous. But it does help if you subscribe. And, you know, I'm asking all my friends to come on and do these interviews. And it would be great to have a, a bigger audience. So I'm going to get that out of the way right now. We got a really cool guest uh, with us today. I say that a lot, but because I get to choose the people I talk to, I think they're all pretty cool. But let's welcome uh, right now Greg D'Angelo. Hey, Jason. How are you? Good, Greg. How are you? I'm good, bud. Good to see Brooklyn, you. Brooklyn in the house again. Brooklyn in the house. Yeah. Um, so, okay, you know, um, I told you a little bit uh, when we were just talking is that I find there's not really so much definitive information, you know, about White Line, about your career. And, uh, and so I think, you know, first of all, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. You oh, know. yeah. Um, you, we're, everybody's really swamped these days. Mm -hmm. It's it's hard. To, it, it's hard. I know. So uh, it, I, I'm, I'm thanking you for coming in here and talking about things that happened 35 years ago. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll do the best as my memory will allow. Sure, absolutely. Well, um, yeah, because it is different. It's not like the old days when, uh, you know, I could ask you, so what are you working on now and what do you got to promote? Instead, mm -hmm. we're going to start with this. Woo! Remember these young guys? Sure do. Okay, so we're going back. Between 1981 and 1983, you were the drummer for a very early version of Anthrax. Yes, I was. So tell me how you got involved with this. Well, the guy to, well, if you're looking at this photo, the guy to my right um, was the lead guitar player. His name is Greg as well. Um, and uh, we went to high school together. And um, he asked if I would be interested in coming down to potentially join this band. And he said, come on, I want to introduce you to the other guitar player, which uh, is Scott, who is on all the way to the left. And Scott was working at Toys R Us in Douglaston, Queens. Wow. And so, you know, Greg and I went over to Toys R Us and saw Scott with his vest in one of the aisles of the Toys R Us. And uh, he was all smiles, a really nice guy. And... Um, and uh, I said, yeah, we're doing this, we're doing that. You want to come down and check it out? I said, sure. I went down and I played with him and it was good fun. And uh, we had some good times together. Yeah, I mean, and obviously this is a very different lineup of what Anthrax would become. Um, That's right. Scott's the only one who stayed with it. Um, with this, That's right, yeah. You know, this, um, but there are some real fun videos uh, on YouTube and stuff where people can see you. Uh, playing with them and you know yeah i was young i think i was like 16 or 17 years old at that point it's pretty amazing you know uh when you were doing it you would never have thought well that band's going to go somewhere nor would you know that you were about to go to a band that ends up being uh, multi-platinum uh, you know as well so yeah. when uh when so white lion comes around pretty soon after i know you played you, i think you played in a band between is that right yeah, I played in a band between, um, uh, actually, with a guy that owned the studio where Anthrax recorded uh, the demos that uh, I was brought in to play on. And um, I wound up spending about a year with him. Um, I was just trying to get better. I was just trying to become a better drummer um, right. and challenge myself, really. Um, and then I joined um, a band called Cities. Okay, right. I did hear about that, yeah in New York and played with them for um, about a year or two. That was a great experience for me, great guitar player, um, Steve Moranovich, and um, really worked out a lot, really sweat a lot, really did a lot of wood shedding in that band. And um, White Lion came soon thereafter, you know, probably within a year. And it, did you, it was, is it true that you answered an ad in the Village Voice for that? Yeah, it's true. It's so funny. I think that's how I, I, I had known about the band. Um, uh, I'd seen the band at Lemore East. Um, I was still in a, um, uh, on good terms with the um, the guys that owned the, the Lemore clubs because Anthrax played Lemore. <clears throat> and I was kind of a regular. 
and um, and uh, I had heard through a couple of people that they were auditioning drummers, and from what I was told, they'd seen hundreds of guys, um, and I, I think I was the last guy to come in, actually. I answered the ad, and uh, the manager said, yeah, you know, we were looking for you as well, couldn't find you, and, and this and that, and um, so I went down, played, and uh, it worked out. It's funny, the Village Voice has done a lot for rock. I mean, I, I think that Paul, uh, Ace Frehley found Kiss through the Village Voice, I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah, I don't know, I, I'm Ace might have, I know Peter did. Okay, yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. so it's, it's, if you're a New Yorker, Village Voice was this famous newspaper that uh, every, everybody was putting ads in the back. So it's, it's funny that it, it, it paid off in your case. Now, so when you, when you meet those guys and you join, um, the, the Fight to Survive record was already recorded, right? Yes, it was. Yeah. So, but what they, uh, and you can explain it better, but what they did is they, because you and James were joining the band, they credited you guys uh, as members on the back of the album. Right. The, the record was recorded. The, the band had a deal with Elektra um, a few years prior to uh, my joining. Um, they recorded the record in Germany. Um, for whatever reason, uh, Elektra decided to shelve the record. And um, the band kind of, uh, you know, they, they uh, disintegrated a little bit. Mike and Vito stayed together and, and brought in, two new, and brought in uh, myself. And uh, when I joined the band, Dave Spitz was playing bass. Right. And um, that lineup lasted about a year, a year and a half. And Dave got the opportunity to join Black Sabbath. So uh, he did that. And uh, we started auditioning bass players. And uh, eventually brought in uh, James and Menzo. Yeah. And in that small world, Dave Spitz is also the brother of Dan Spitz, who would then become guitar player in Anthrax. Yeah. Very incestuous. Yeah, that's just for that New York uh, uh, vibe. Yeah. Um, but so when you first started playing shows, you guys were promoting songs off this album, right? Yeah, we played, for the first couple of years I was in the band, we played um, solely that record. And this was, a, you know, a, it's a heavier record, um, and I know a lot of people like it, but at the same time, um, what was about to come was definitely going to be, you know, more commercial and obviously lead to a much bigger success. So talk a little bit about um, what happens when you guys are getting ready to record uh, Pride. Well, you know, um, I really liked the songs on uh, the Fight to Survive record. Um, I thought the songwriting was really great. You, you could hear um, a lot of Mike's influence from, from Thin Lizzy and from mm -hmm. Queen. You know, a lot of that stuff comes across in that record. And um, it was no mistake that the sound changed somewhat uh, when we went to do Pride. We were listening to what was happening. You know, uh, we, uh, you know, uh, the Dokken records um, were a big target for us at, at, at one point. Mm -hmm. um, we wound up using our producer. We wound up using Michael Wagner, as a matter of fact. And I think uh, under lock and key was probably one of the, you know, uh, predominant reasons why we, did, we decided to go with Michael. Um, but um, we wanted uh, a little bit more modern sound and we, you know, and we kind of tried our best to hone ourselves to uh, do, you know, what we would need to do to, you know, join that club, join that major label club. And, uh, and, and try to achieve some success there. And you're still early to the game, so to speak. You know, second I, mean, wave. I think yeah. second wave, yeah. Yeah, because 87, you're, it's before, once you're gonna get into 89, 90, everyone's signing anything and um, you, know, you get that overkill. 87, mm -hmm. good time to have a record come out and you know to have a, a commercial record that obviously has hit material on it. And did you feel like the label got behind you guys? Because most of the people I interview have the opposite story. 100%. In fact, um, you know, we were very proactive. We would go up to the label on a regular basis and, and sit there and say, what can we do to help? We'll get on the phones. We'll, we'll do whatever we need to do to, to make this up, you know, make this happen. And our management team was young and uh, very enthusiastic and, and uh, you know, we all, as a team, really kept our shoulder against it. 
to do uh, what we had to do to, uh, you know, to make it happen. Um, in fact, the interesting thing is, is we had gotten so close with, uh, with uh, some of the managers and directors up at, at uh, the label that, you know, we would socialize. I mean, it was that same little circle in New York socialize after and we I think I had gone out with one of the uh, managers after uh, after uh, work uh, one day after the you know we had signed and and uh, we had done the first video and and um, she told me that uh, you don't know how lucky you are and I, I'm like why you know 20 year old 21 year old kid why um, she says well we had our uh, budget meetings today and we decided on what acts we were going to put our money behind and it was robert plant debbie gibson in excess and us four four bands for the year so um <laughs> i i didn't realize what that meant back then um but uh i certainly do now and uh it certainly became apparent when uh we were ready to promote the second record and they had 27 acts to work yeah so, i know it's pretty amazing. Like I said, I mean, I talk to people with, with these interviews and most people, and again, most of the bands were a little bit later and the window was closing and, you know, some uh -huh. guys were able to stay in, but most didn't have that experience. And so you guys get a, get a single, you know, wait, which becomes a big hit. This is in the days of, you know, dial in TV and, and these things and it's playing constantly. And so white line is playing right next to Bon Jovi, Def Leppard, uh, you know, the, the major things at the time and you guys are right in that um in that world and you've got something you know one of the things that you guys had to offer is obviously musicianship you know this is a good band you know everyone is you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and 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 vito was this guitar becoming this guitar hero i mean everyone knew he could play but i think that the um the audiences were starting to see it and maybe the guitar magazines and things were starting to pick up on that um as well. We always took a lot of pride in, in trying to be the best musicians we could be. Um, we worked really hard at it and uh, we worked really hard at becoming a cohesive unit, you know, in really a, a short span of time, um, especially for guys that were so young. Yeah, no, I, I get it. So um, weight becomes a major single. I got to tell you, I don't know how much walking around the city you do, but I do. When I go to the traffic light and you push the button across the street and it says wait, uh, I have to push it again and try to. Uh, <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> my friends are all sick of hearing it. I watch this, and, they, and, they, and sometimes you gotta go. Don't you remember White Line? But, all right. Um, uh, no. But so, okay, so that's a you know, it's it's a, a big success, and then of course you know when the children cry, uh, you, you know, uh, did you ever say why is the biggest song got to be one that has no, no no bass and no drums on it? No, but a lot of other people have told me that, uh, <laughs> which is fine. I got to play tambourine, which was exciting. Um, um, I, listen, we were happy for the, for the success. You know, I, mean, I should say I, I was happy for the success, whether or not there were drums on the track or not. Um, when we played it live, we, we made it heavy uh, for the end of the tune, for like the last chorus or something like that. I forgot what we did. But, um, you know, drums and bass kicked in for that. So... You know, it's all good. Yeah, no, I, I, it's, it's like it was you and Mr. Big. You know, they had the same, uh, you know, same thing, single with no bass and drums a little later. Uh, not Mr. Big, um, ext Extreme. Yeah. Were the words. But, yeah, it became kind of a, uh, a pattern <laughs> with a lot of the bands back then. You know, you need that ballad. You need, you need that acoustic ballad. Well, you know? uh, yeah, and, and again, I mean, I think you're a little early uh, to that to that as well, you know. Uh, I mean, I know this ballads were happening, but it was White Line was at the time when people were watching and saying every other label was going, "Well, we got to crank out, you know, let's put out two rockers and then let's get to that ballad." And you were lucky if you got to the ballad, right? A lot of bands never made yeah. it that far. Yeah, it was a hail mary. I mean, that was the third. I think that was the third single off the record, and uh, you know, it was like, well, are we going to go for another one? I don't know. Should we go for another one? You know, and this we're like, yeah, we definitely want to go for another one. But the label was like, I don't know. Should we go for another one? And we had a very truncated budget for the video. The video, you know, I think it was like 30 grand. That was like 10% of what people used to spend back then. For sure. Um, and it was one guy with his little Bolex camera, you know, winding it up, going around and taking like, 
you know, 30 second shots or whatever, you know, you know, that spring allowed you and um, it worked. Yeah, absolutely. So talk a little bit about, so now you guys are going out and touring. You know, White Lion, it's a quick thing. You know, your involvement, it, it's about six years, three records. And so it's, it seems like it's happening really fast. So tell me a little bit about what it's like at that point and, and some of the touring that you were doing, you know, for that record. Well, before White Lion got, you mean before we got signed to Atlantic or? or no, I'm time? talking about after it, uh, after, you know, Pride is out and starting to pick up. Right. Well, we started um, the, the Pride tour opening for Ace Freely. And, um, and uh, you know, it was the first time uh, we had really had a, a regular slot, uh, you know, on, on any kind of tour. And we were doing uh, VFW halls some small theaters and things like that. And uh, it was all new to us and we were having a great time. Um, then we wound up, uh, at the end of that year, we wound up going out with Kiss. And that was the first time we, we had a, a regular stint with uh, uh, a major band in an arena. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a dream come true, really. You know, uh, forever thankful to uh, Gene and Paul for bringing us out. and Put a lot, uh, of, put a lot yeah. of eyes on you. Yeah. yeah, and really giving us the exposure. It was very generous of them. And... Um, and uh, you know, uh, we did that in the fall. Took a took a break for Christmas, and uh, then, if memory serves, then we did the uh, the, the video for uh, for Wait, mm -hmm. and we went to Europe, and we toured Europe for a couple months. And when we got and when we were in Europe, our managers were telling us, "Wait till you get back. Everything's different. You're going to see a big difference." And Wait had hit. It was on the radio. It was a popular video on MTV and uh, we got home and it was like, whoa, you know, people are starting to pay attention. And we got the Aerosmith tour and we got the ACDC tour. And, uh, you know, we had two years of uh, an incredible, incredible experience. Yeah, and, pl so, and from that point on, you're playing on support spots in, in arenas, you know, you're reaching yeah. um, tons and tons of people who are so, you know, uh, no pun intended, hungry. Uh, for mm -hmm. that music, you know, everyone yeah. was kind of looking for their band to identify and, uh, with, and uh, you guys did a lot of that. So when it comes time to to write songs for, for the big game record, is there any, is it just kind of Mike and Vito are the writers and that's it? Do you guys try to contribute something or do you feel like you're kept out of that? What's what's that process like? Yeah, they, they kind of had their thing going and they wanted to maintain that. And uh, we were on a very tight schedule. Atlantic wanted the record yesterday. Um, you know, uh, when we did the Pride record, we had years, literally like two, two three years in, in a basement, in the basement of Lemoore, working out arrangements, coming up with different parts as a band you know, and figuring, seeing what worked right, what didn't work right. And, and, you know, we had that luxury. Pride was, I mean, a big game was done in a couple of weeks. You know, we, James and I went, went back to Brooklyn. We were, I think we were living in LA at that point. Mm -hmm. And we got into a rehearsal room with Vito. Mike wasn't with us. And we went through, you know, these very rudimentary arrangements that Vito had and, 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 uh, figured out transitions and songs, and we really didn't have too much of an idea of what the vocal was going to be doing, um, which I never liked. I, I always like to know what the vocalist is, is going to do. It makes me play differently. Yeah, I can imagine. But, but uh, that said, um, we kind of rushed that record, honestly. And, I, and I, you know, in hindsight, I wish we would have had a little bit more time to um, – kind of work some other things out, work some other parts out of that record and, uh, you know, maybe have a little bit more in input into uh, some, you know, a lot of different aspects of that record. It's got, and I, I don't want to take too much away from the record. I mean, it's definitely got its high moments. We got to play Radar Love and, mm -hmm. you know, I had a drum solo that was mine, you know, that was the number one video on MTV, you know, so, you know, I'm very proud of that. Um, that, that, talking about that video, I mean, that video was is crazy, you know, for that time. Yeah, a lot uh, of money on that video. Yeah, I'm sure, yeah. yeah. And so yeah. where was that filmed, by the way? That was filmed out in Castaic, out, uh, Castaic in the, uh, you know, in uh, 
Eastern Los Angeles, Northeast yeah, kind, of by Los six, Angeles. By, kind of by Six Flags uh, out there. Yeah, yeah, right around there. Um, yeah, th so anyway, that video is crazy. I mean, it's like watching a Michael Bay uh, a movie, you know. It's... Yeah, that was uh, John Pellerin. He went on to direct features. You could tell he was going to. You know what yeah. I mean? That this was yeah. a a big a big a vision and, and a cool video that you know people can check out. But so, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, there was definitely hits on this record. Uh, this is another big selling record, but like you said, it came out fast. Pride is 87. This record's 89. Yeah. Um, with touring in between, that's pretty fast. Um, it was very fast. It was very fast. And, uh, you know, it is what it is. You, when, when you're, when you're young and, uh, there's a bunch of grownups telling you, Hey, we need this now. This is how the business works. And this is what we need to do. We're like, well, okay, I guess, you, you know, you guys know what you're doing. And, and in a sense, they were right, and they did. They wanted to capitalize on the momentum we had off of pride. Um, so it's, I, I do not not understand it. Um, uh, but that said, artistically, we probably could have done a little bit more. Yeah, I get you. You, mean, you, you feel that you could put out a better product had you had more time, but the double-edged sword is if you waited too long, someone else, you know, a few other bands would have, would have moved into you know kind of your your spot so to speak mm -hmm. um so okay and, okay and so talk about the touring for that because you did some big big tours too yeah yeah we opened up for for uh, cinderella right um, uh, we opened for ozzy yeah um, cool. we did uh we did uh, a theater tour with uh striper mm -hmm. and um we were going to um I forgot if we were going to hop off of that and do our own um, headlining theater headlining tour or not. Um, <clears throat> honestly, I don't remember. But um, again, you know, got to play with Ozzy Osbourne. You know, got to uh, hang out with Ozzy Osbourne and uh, and uh, you know the guys in Cinderella. You know, Fred's still a uh, good friend of mine, and uh, we keep in touch and. Uh, you know, great yeah. relationships. It's funny, you know, how the, this, again, that kind of incestuous world, you know, a lot of people are talking about, you know, I interviewed uh, Simon Wright the other day who was on the Blow Up Your Video tour that you did. Mm -hmm. and, That's right, yeah. Yeah, Oz Fox just uh, the other day who's in Striper, you know, so it's like the community, still, there is some still, uh, you know, uh, constants out there of that. We're, we're all hanging in there, right? Yeah, well, and, and you know what, we're, we're, we're lucky, right? Yeah. Right, we, uh, um, Count my blessing. Yes. And so, not, again, another time where you guys are out in arenas, tons of eyes on you, um, you know. And at, at this point, um, you know, it, music is starting to change a little bit after this record. I mean, you still had a good – you're still kind of in the prime of that. Um, mm -hmm. It's not until, you know, um, Main Attraction doesn't come out until 91. Mm -hmm. Now, 91 – you're looking at a changing um, scene, you know, um, at least the beginning of one. Um, right. You know, people playing different things. And so to me, this is a really interesting um, part of, of the court of, of the your stay with White Lion, obviously. So what is it like making this record? This was a completely different experience. We changed producers. We went into an expensive studio. We spent a lot more time. Um, everything was scrutinized. Um, we had a separate engineer. Um, you know, God bless Michael Wagner. He uh, he uh, held down uh, you know title of producer and engineer and watching the budget and making sure everything was done tight and right and, and all that stuff. We had a little bit more breath on uh, main attraction. Uh, Richie Zito came in. He was producer of the year that year. Mm -hmm. um, it's a wonderful sounding record. Um, you know, and um, in a lot of ways, it was um, kind of, kind of, you know, a, a real growth point for the band. And um, maybe, um, you know, foretelling of what could have, uh, what we could have built on. Um, you know, unfortunately that didn't happen, but, um, again, 
Uh, very proud of that record. There's some real high high moments on it. Some great sounds, great sounding record. Um, you know, it's uh, so. Th this is where it gets interesting. Um, you're in the videos for this record, and mm -hmm. did, did you tour for this record at all? We did. We toured Europe for the for this record, and um, and uh, went our separate ways uh, after yeah. the European tour. Yeah, so let's get in. Let's get into that okay. <laughs> because it wouldn't be a, it, it, this wouldn't be interesting if we didn't ask. And I don't feel like there's really a very good answer out there. You know, those guys put out a video, uh, like a documentary, Escape from Brooklyn. Uh huh. Sort of just sweeps you guys under you and James Lomenzo under the rug, and they uh -huh. kind of showcase the, the new guys. You know, no disrespect uh -huh. to those guys, um, and they kind of try to hype up the story. And then at the end of the video, it basically says, and that's the end. And and so. They never really say why you and James both decide to leave White Line. And so now that we have you here, maybe you can tell us why. Um, I, well, you know, I can I can allude to it. You know, there are growing pains in bands. And, um, you know, uh, we had, you know, we had different ideas of what we wanted to do. And uh, it just kind of ran its course. I'll put it that way. I'm and um, and uh, we're gonna have to have a follow up on that one. Uh, <laughs> so, so you and J you and James both happen to leave at the same time. So, in my opinion, you guys obviously well, it's obvious you guys made a decision that this isn't working. The band only continued with the other members for three months. Uh -huh. So, did, was there a part of you that, looking forward, thought it wasn't going to work? Yeah. Did, did be, now, is there something legal involved? I mean, was there, was there a, is this a money thing? Uh, I really can't talk about that. Yeah, okay, that's interesting, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, so, if, <laughs> if you're watching at home, I, I, look, this is just me talking. Yeah. James and Greg probably got screwed on some money and didn't want to go out again. Uh, right. This is my hunch. You, if you don't sue those guys. Well, that's an interesting perspective. I can't confirm or deny. But, uh, sure, absolutely. But uh, you know, if as an outsider, uh, that would seem like there was some kind of um, issue, and also because uh, Vito and Mike were writing and controlling the publishing, they were probably taking again. This is just me talking. They were probably taking more money, and uh, and maybe you guys wanted to renegotiate a little bit before committing to this. At the same time, grunge music is breathing down everyone's backs at this time. And um, all of a sudden, something like White Lion, you li listen, an incredibly musical band, but you do have a blonde guy wearing yellow pants. And if someone is going to be made an example of, you know, if someone's going to get sacrificed, it's going to be a band like White Lion. And it's unfortunate because, as you said, too, your last record really shows this musical growth. And this is these are talented guys. This is not, you know, I don't want to name the other bands, but this is not one of those guys who got signed in 91 and, Right, was about looks, but uh, so again, my opinion you maybe you see the writing on the wall and you just couldn't keep it going. And ultimately, you you must have made the right decision, you know. It, it, it's it was kind of not really about making a, a right or a wrong decision if, if I were to have made that. Um, we were young guys, you know, we, we were really young guys and we had a lot of stuff thrown at us, um, you know, all at once. And it was a lot to handle. And um, honestly, I don't think we got the best advice. Um, you know, that's not to throw anybody under the bus, but um, you know, we kind of needed a little bit of guidance. We kind of needed a little bit of guidance. This was all, we all came from working class families, mm -hmm. you know, and um, we had never been exposed to this kind of world. And um, we really didn't have any idea of how to handle it, you know? So, um, and, and you know, everything I'm saying is a very, very typical story, sure. you know, with, with uh, a lot of different bands, you know? Um, I don't think anybody really starts off super rich. And uh, goes and becomes a rock star. Maybe, maybe today they do. I know a couple of a couple of uh, famous people that are in that situation where they could just where they just bought it, which is more more power to them. Right. Um, but definitely wasn't us. We were working class kids from the suburbs of New York, 
And, uh, you know, I think if we had a little bit more depth, we could have maybe navigated our way around it. And it's unfortunate that it panned out the way it did. Um, like I said, I was, you know, I'm very proud of the last record we made. And I think it was a uh, foreshadowing of uh, what could have come. Yeah, you know, and we're talking about something that happened 30 years ago, you know, so obviously, right. uh, as you're alluding to, maybe you would have handled it differently if different people were involved. And you had more experience in business, and the music business has also changed. But right. back then, I can see somebody saying, you should be getting this and you should be doing that, and then people not talking directly, and now you have a, a business that will sometimes kill, um, you know, the art, too. Yeah, the thing is, you know, if they, if everything is working out the right way and everybody is kind of, you know, everybody keeps their eye on the same prize, we could have got through the 90s. Mm -hmm. We could have played and, and done what we did and made enough money to keep us happy and living and content. Um, you know, I don't think, I don't, you know, everybody says grunge kind of screwed up heavy metal. I don't think grunge screwed up heavy metal at all, really. Um, I think if anything, you know, the whole uh, big hair heavy metal uh, thing of uh, the late '80s went went to country mm -hmm. more than more than uh, you know grunge erasing the genre. I don't think I just think it shifted. Yeah, you know, I shifted to country. You know, um, crunch was its own thing. You know, it wasn't an offshoot of uh, '80s metal. Not at all. Exactly. Yeah, I, I think that may, well, it's the easy thing to say when well, Nirvana came and that was that. And that's not exactly how it happens. Now, do I think that there was kids listening to, you know, nothing but a good time and suddenly something comes out that's darker? Maybe. Because when you're at that age, uh, if you're listening to some of the, the your genre, maybe you're 15, 16. And then as this new thing comes, you're 18. Maybe you start to have a different and people just gravitate to a different music. But they were, as you're saying, there are bands that survived just fine, you know, and, and I was talking to uh, Bill Leverty uh, from Firehouse uh, this morning, and that band found a new audience in Asia that they right. that exactly. they didn't get. They, exactly. they got bigger. Right. They got bigger there. They, I mean, they, they had even more, and we're talking about the 2000s. They were selling tons of records. So the right. bands that wrote it out, you know, and then, you know, some of the bigger bands too, you know, Bon Jovi and whoever, they didn't, grunge didn't kill them, you know, and, uh, mm -hmm. Or, um, you know, so I get what you're saying. If it, maybe it would, it would have been a different thing, maybe you would have been playing an arena, but you could have kept the, the thing, the business going. Um, yeah. so for me, this kind of closes that first chapter. Well, it kind of closes the book in general on White Line. I know later Mike Tramp had a bunch of scab fake White Lines, um, but that's not the band. And so, mm -hmm. um, so let's get right to it. When, when's the reunion? <laughs> you know. Uh, oh boy. You know, um, I think it's kind of hard to, to, especially after so much time has passed. I don't think any anybody would really want to do it unless everybody would wanted to do it. And right. um, you know, and um, Vito is 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 um, taking care of his family. I have a lot of respect for him for doing that. Um, I spent some time with him. I spent you know a few hours with him. Um, a couple of years ago when I, when I was in New York um, and it was great to see him and great to catch up. And, um, you know, I talk to him a few times a year or email him a few times a year and, uh, you know, he's doing okay. He's uh, fulfilling his uh, responsibilities like a good Italian boy does mm -hmm. and taking care of his mom. And, uh, you know, I have nothing but respect for him for that, you know, and um, he's complained to me a couple of times about, uh, about uh, having some pain when he plays, right? You know that might contribute to his desire uh, to 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 do anything again. And you know, I, I think he kind of uh, appreciates uh, what we did, and he respects the memory of the band. And um, at this point, it you know, unless you know those guys were, were on board to do that, you know, Vito was on board to do it and Mike agreed to it, it doesn't really make much sense to kind of talk about it. Of course. You know, I don't think anybody needs to do it to, uh, you know, to do some bastardized version of the band where, you know, it, it wasn't true to what it was. At least that's what I like to think. Um, and that seems to be the case. 
And, um, you know, stay tuned. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I, you never say never. But I don't no. know. People love to speculate, obviously, because you are one of the only bands of the scene that did not get back together in some capacity. Yeah, um, no. I've heard it often. Sure, I know you did. And, and, and so, and Vito did pop up a bunch of years back on Eddie Trunk. Uh -huh. And he seemed to really enjoy um, talking to fans and talking about White Line and the possibility that things could happen. And he made the point that he did not ever rule out a White Line reunion. It just wasn't the time for him to do it because he was taking care of family. And, right. uh, and so, it, you know, it, I think that maybe at some point uh, Mike Tramp might have painted him as a bad guy. Um, but it, that wasn't the case. Well, you know, Mike's a worker. Mike likes to work. And I, I have a ton of respect for that. And, um, you know, maybe he did want to do it at one point and maybe, maybe there was a little frustration. I don't know. I honestly don't know, but, um, you know, um, everybody's on good footing right now, I think. And, uh, I'm happy to be talking to, uh, Mike and Vito and, uh, you know, and um, and uh, really just uh, having pleasant memories of what uh, we did together. You know, we uh, we had a cool little club there for a while. Yeah, that's a bond that doesn't break, and it, so it's great that you guys. And you know, unfortunately, the way the life is, people are, are disappearing. It's great that you can still be friends and stay in touch. And you know, like you said, you never know if Vito is a hand. You know, if he's not as comfortable playing guitar, and he said that, then you're right. Why would he? He was amazing at what he did. Why would he want to go out yeah. and not be able to yeah, do that? He was, yeah. Um, and not be able to do that. So, um, but, you know, so the answer is you never know. Um, never know. Uh, we, yeah, we can see what happens. So after White Line, you still, you know, obviously you still were playing. You, you, you were living in Los Angeles, which you still do. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so tell me about a little bit of what you did. I mean, I know you played with, with Stephen Pierce here for a while from Rat. Sure. And you sort of... You sort of kind of tour managed that as well, right? Uh, by default, yeah. <laughs> um, well, somebody had to do, do it. Somebody had to do it. Um, pr prior is right after leaving White Lion, I played with Zach Wild for oh, about right. four or five years, and um, when James both went to do that. We did. That's right. And um, did it continually up to about a week before the record was um, to come out, and. Uh, I left that as well um, and decided to go into um, into business. And I had a recording studio in Los Angeles and um, kind of left the drums for a little bit and um, educated myself on engineering and owning a studio and running a studio. And uh, I had a good 12 year run with that. And by the time it was done, I had hosted uh, Michael Jackson, Madonna, and um, you know a lot of big acts, uh, a yeah. lot of a lot of very famous engineers. Um, um, it was kind of I was in a very unique and uh, fortunate position in that um, I acted as a second engineer, engineer producer. But most most um, most fortunate for me was really being second engineer to a lot of the uh, a lot of great. Uh, engineers and producers that came in and hired out my room. Um, so I learned a lot, you know, sitting next to the guy that was, that made tons of hit records, guys that, you know, top shelf guys that, uh, yeah. that uh, you know, were making great records and I learned what they did. And, uh, and uh, I, I uh, have wonderful memories of those days. It was great. By the time, by the time we finished, by the time I sold the studio, we had, uh, you know, two big SSL consoles and, um, you know, a great run. Like I said, a great run. And, yeah. Yeah. And so, okay, so tell me what happens after that. After that, I um, found myself um, in, in, a, in a unique position. You know, it's, it's really weird when a musician buys, when anybody buys a house, you know, the first time, like I did when I, when I left White Lion, all of a sudden you have this ridiculous responsibility of having to pay this mortgage and, and, and all these taxes and insurances and all this stuff. And then I started a business and I had to maintain the business and do all that kind of stuff. So it, it, there's a weight to it, you know, and it, and my personality type is, is such that I took um, a lot of responsibility and, uh, and uh, had to make sure that it was done right. So, um, 
while the studio was running when I wasn't needed there, I went back to school, went back to UCLA, and I got a degree in history. And I was wow. just and I was just prepping to go to law school. I was, you know, I got accepted to uh, to USC Law, and um, I was just about to to tick that box um, when I decided that's not what I wanted to do. And um, so I sold the studio, um, sold my house, was completely debt free, was completely responsibility free. And um, I went to England for a year and I played with um, a friend of mine named Alex Kane and he had a band there called Antiproduct. And we toured uh, formerly Eastern Bloc countries in a van, you know, just like the old days and, uh, you know, pumped gear, sweated and loved every minute of it. Yeah, and, sometimes uh, those experiences stand yeah. out. Yeah, and um, after that, I came home. That ran its course. I came home, and uh, I was going to get my mail one day, and uh, I uh, walked past Stephen Piercy's house. And then he said, hey. And I said, hey, what are you doing? You know, and we kind of caught up. He asked me to come play with him, and that lasted for about, um, I don't know, five or six years. Yeah. And um, I left... I don't know, two or three years ago. And um, since then, I've been uh, mixing, producing, recording tracks out of my studio. Been doing a lot of that over the last year, especially. Um, you like to keep working. I, I noticed that. I like, yeah, I like to keep busy, you know. And, um, and um, um, sorry, I just got distracted from you. Um, that was Vito Brada. He just came over to. Get the yeah. band back. Yeah. What are you doing here? That's fine. Uh, <laughs> but uh, listen, you know, um, everything everything is great. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't change a thing, honestly, out of uh, the way everything has panned out. Um, you know, the um, maybe maybe uh, you know, I would I, I'd be curious to see what White Line would have sounded like a few years deeper. But um, other than that. I've had a great run. I've been very, very fortunate and continue to be. Yeah, and that's that's the best thing. And and now um, in a time like this when a lot of us are at home, it's great that you're able to make, uh, you know, you can still make music, you can mix, you. there's other things you can do. People still need studios. And when this opens, um, there's going to be a lot of people looking to do things. Um, yeah, and, and I'm looking forward to playing too. You know, um, I... Um, did a couple of shows with uh, Carlos Cavasso and Paul Shortino and, and um, yeah, Sean McKinnon, um, right before this virus hit, and um, that was a lot of fun. You know, maybe some more of that will be coming down the road. Um, and I also have um, a uh, an all star band with Terry Loose from from um, Great White. Yeah, and right. yeah, yes, and um, and uh, we're called the Legends of Classic Rock, and uh, we actually had a whole year booked. Uh, right when this pandemic broke, we we did one gig, and uh, we had it. We had a year booked, and everything went in the toilet. So uh, Terry and I are excited to uh, wake that up again as soon as uh, everything starts moving. And um, you know that's going to be uh, a focus of mine. We're we're going to pay some attention to that. Yeah. No. It's. It, uh, that, that sounds great. It's funny you say, because just the other day I was trying to get Cavazzo to do one of these interviews, which isn't easy. You know, he is not a, he's private, you know, he's not he's a real a private guy. guy. Yeah, he's a private guy. He's a, not, he, he's a great guy, but he's not a real chatter. Yeah. I, I remember when some of the drama was going on with Rat and stuff. He really had no idea. He's not on social media. He doesn't, right. he doesn't pay attention. Uh, yeah. Vicky, you can always get through to him through Vicky. You know? That's how, that's exactly what I'm doing. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, yeah. Geez. Because he, uh, you know, I, I booked him. To, we've done some signings and things together. You know, I've had him do some things, and uh, he likes the he likes it. He's, he likes the yeah. people, but he's just not the type of guy to sit and, and rehash so much. Uh, and then Terry, Terry uh, Elus, he, he, you can't shut him up. You know, he'll, oh, he'll, yeah, he'll, he'll tell you all about. He'll tell well, you all about. I could tell you, Car Carlos is a monster guitar player. It, it was such a treat to play with him. Um, what a great experience. Um, and Terry is one of the most enthusiastic guys and, and one of the best singers, you know, that I've been fortunate enough to, uh, enough to play with. Um, he constantly. So I'm, I'm keeping good company these days. 
Yeah. Oh no, for sure. I mean, both those projects are really, you know, really good things and fun things. And so, as we said, we know that when things open up, there's going to be a real uh, a need for live music entertainment. And it doesn't hurt to have somebody like yourself who has, you know, uh, a big name behind you and, and a lot of record sales and things. People, people like to see the people from the past because, the, you know, unfortunately, like we said, there's only so many. So, right. So, Greg, thank you. I'm glad we got to catch up. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure. Good to see you, man. It's yeah, now you're, you're, still, you're looking good. <laughs> you're looking good. You're looking thank like you. you're I staying, get all healthy, stuff. Yeah. staying healthy in Las Vegas, huh? Yeah, we just had a snowstorm, though. Did you really? Yeah. About wow. once a year we get it. It doesn't last very long. but uh, Wow, that's great. But, but anyway, but I'm hoping we get you back out here. And now, for the viewers, this is where I'm going to ask you all the really interesting stuff, but unfortunately, they're not going to get to hear anything about it. Okay. So anyway, we will talk again soon, Greg. Okay. Great to see you. You too. Bye-bye.